Hey guys, so we just did another episode of Fresh Cat Friday Live. This week we had Adam Harriton from Learn Your Land on the show. And if you don't know about Adam Harriton or Learn Your Land, you should definitely go check out his YouTube channel. He's an educator and he's got hundreds of videos on identifying uh, wild mushrooms and plants, how to forage them, and what to do with those. And we had a fascinating conversation all about how we got interested in mushrooms in the first place, um, what people who are new to the hobby can do to get into foraging mushrooms. We also talked about his brand new course that he'll be launching, or is launching right now, about um, foraging wild mushrooms and harvesting wild mushrooms and uh, using them for food and for medicine. So it's a really great conversation. I apologize for the audio. Um, it's, it's not perfect and you can actually hear the dogs barking a little bit in the background on some of the clips, but uh, either way, it doesn't really matter. Adam has, uh, he's such a well-spoken individual and he's got lots of really great things to say about mushrooms and about nature and about getting out there and seeing what you can find. So I hope you enjoy the interview and we're going to be trying to do this kind of thing every single week. So stay tuned and enjoy the show. And hey, there he is. Adam, Adam welcome to Fresh Camp Friday. Hey, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. All right. Yeah, it's so cool to have you on. So for everybody watching, if you don't know Adam, he is uh, the founder of Learn Your Land. He also has an amazing YouTube channel. He's an educator. Uh, he's a walk leader and a board member of one of the largest organiza uh, mushroom organizations in uh, North America, the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. Um, he's got over 100 instructional videos on how to find mushrooms, how to forage mushrooms and wild plants, and what to do with those mushrooms. And uh, super amazing video. So Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, it's great to have you on. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's a beautiful day awesome. to be on here with you guys and looking forward to chatting for a bit. Yeah. Really, really great. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about right off the bat is how you got interested in mushrooms in the first place. It's kind of a niche topic for a lot of people. Uh, most people think of mushrooms as, you know, those things you buy at the grocery store and wild mushrooms as those, you know, red ones with the white dots on the top. But how did you get so interested in mushrooms in the first place? That's the million dollar question that everybody wants to know. How did I get into this? So, I mean, I got into this relatively late in life, about 10 years ago, maybe, but only in the past five or six years that I really dive in deeply and start pursuing the work that I'm doing now. But I don't even know how it happened. You know, like the why questions in life are the ones that can't really be answered. And if you think you can answer it, you still got to keep going deeper as to what the true why is. But maybe 10 years ago, I just realized that I was totally disconnected from nature and from the land. Like I knew nothing, no trees, no mushrooms, no plants, nothing at all. And I was hurting because of it. I don't know where that awareness came from. So I just started spending time outside. And for some reason, it was the mushroom kingdom, the fungal kingdom that kept me tethered to the woods. Like I kept coming back. And over time, you know, I hooked up with the community of foragers here, the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. It just skyrocketed into what it is today. But I'm fortunate because where I live in Western Pennsylvania, we have probably the largest nature club in the entire world which you mentioned, the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. And, I mean, we meet literally five miles from where I live. So I'm fortunate to have that community, and they've been supporting me in this all those years. Yeah, that's that's truly awesome. I mean, you are kind of blessed to live in such a great area mm -hmm. uh, for, for going to forage wild mushrooms. And you tell by your videos, there's such an amazing variety of different mushrooms that you can go and find. So, and, and you're right, that's one of the things that keeps drawing you back to the forest because every time you go, it's almost like hunting Pokemon or something. Like, you never know what you're going to find. There's always, you know, a different species depending on the time of year or depending on where you go. You can go one day and see nothing and go the next day and see an amazing plethora of mushrooms that popped up overnight. So I can definitely see that excitement. Um, you know, many people are kind of afraid of mushrooms, and there's this thing called, you know, fungophobia, and you're doing a great job to kind of subvert that. But, you know, a lot of people think that, um, foraging mushrooms is is really scary and you know a certain amount of fear is definitely warranted because there are some dangerous mushrooms but for example you don't see that with plants whereas there's also a number of, of you know deadly and dangerous plants that you could forage for but for some reason mushrooms hold this kind of lore this kind of uh, fungophobia so I wanted you to talk a little bit about why you think you know that exists and and, and what you know what you're trying to do to kind of subvert that that fear so I think it's important whenever we talk about mycophobia to understand that it's not timeless and it's not universal, meaning it hasn't always been this way, and it's not this way everywhere around the world. So, I mean, we're speaking here, I assume you're in North America, right? In yeah, the yeah. United yeah. States. Um, so it is pretty big here, but it's not big 
elsewhere in the world, some places for sure. And it probably always wasn't this way here in North America. But, you know, I think it starts with we fear what we don't know. And if we don't know a lot about mushrooms, if we don't know a lot about the fungal kingdom, it's easy to see why some people would be afraid of them. And it also starts with your parents. It starts with your grandparents. It starts with your family. It starts with the educational system as well. You know, I never learned about mushrooms in school. And I took university-level biology classes. And what's interesting is we skipped over the fungal kingdom. We literally just took that chapter out, even though it was right there. And I couldn't hmm. believe it. So that summer, I went back to the biology library, checked out that text, and just read it. Because that's what I was interested in. And I thought, oh, there's got to be something juicy in there if they're not teaching us that, right? <laughs> and so I yeah. just educated myself. And then I'm trying to educate other people as well. But um, I think the more that we learn, and that's why I try to educate people just in appreciating them and just seeing them, the more that that veil is lifted and the more that we can understand. But the thing about mushrooms is that, you know, they're different than plants in many ways, obviously, but they can never be mastered because they're so cryptic. They're so mysterious. I know the science of mycology is newer, but it just baffles mycologists. It baffles ecologists, it baffles biologists to try to gain a grasp or a stronghold on this kingdom. And I think that's why mushrooms are out there. They trick us. They're the tricksters in nature. <laughs> and so it's tough to master. And they almost kind of like make us feel that fear just a little bit, but in healthy doses. But it's taken to the extreme here in North America. And so, I mean, the more that we eat them, the more that we appreciate them, the more that we study them, the less fear that we will fear overall. Yeah. And I think that's a really good approach, right? Just education. Um, and you're right, mushrooms are so interesting and, you know, new things are being discovered about them all the time. And it is often overlooked, which is quite a shame. So it's good to see that, you know, a lot more people are becoming interested in mushrooms in general and, and trying to learn about, the, you know, this amazing fifth kingdom, the kingdom of fungi. So I've definitely seen that over the years, a huge, you know, in, increase in interest uh, in mushrooms in general. So that, that's really great. So, you know, if, if people are becoming interested in, in learning about mushrooms or going out to forage, um, it can seem totally overwhelming at first. You know, there's, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of species. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know what they're looking for. They almost all look the same. So what advice would you give to somebody who wanted to just get started foraging in their local area? If you're interested in learning how to forage, if you're interested in learning more mushrooms or plants or anything, two things that I can recommend. Number one, hook up with other people who are doing what you want to do. Meaning join a nature club, join a mycological society, join a mushroom club, join a botanical club, join a wildflower society, whatever it is. It doesn't matter if the people are 40 years older than you. And that's mostly the case whenever I hang out with a lot of these organizations. It doesn't matter because those are your mentors, those are your teachers. And even if they don't talk about the edible properties, it doesn't matter because identification is a huge part of it. And they bring you into new areas that you wouldn't normally explore in your own time. So you got to hook up with people. you got to hook up with the clubs. And if that means you have to move, then move. You know, I, where I live right now, I live maybe four miles away from where Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club meets. I moved here strategically. This is no accident. I literally moved up to this area to be closer to those people and to be closer to the areas where we hunt mushrooms. That's how much it means to me. I mean, you got to move to where the communities are. It's hard to do it by yourself. I mean, there's an illusion today that we can do things ourselves. We can be the lone wolf. Like, I can take care of it myself with the Internet. It's like, good luck. You'll go so much further and faster if you hook up with other people. And the other thing that you can do besides just joining a mushroom club, hang out in nature as much as you possibly can. you got to spend time with what you want to learn. Even if you can't put names behind it, that's okay. You know, I spent years and years and years just looking at them, just observing them, just noticing them. And if you notice them, I'll bet that, two years down the line, three or four years down the line, you'll come across the identification of it. It'll just pop up. But you got to be patient and you got to be persistent and dedicated. So hang out with other people and hang out with that which you want to study, with the mushrooms or the plants or whatever you want to study. Yeah, yeah, I think that's some really good advice. And actually, it kind of harkens back to something I read from one of Tom Brown's books uh, many years ago. Uh, but he talks about not trying to identify everything, but just maybe just learn it first and look at the characteristics. And so instead of trying to key something out right away, just, you know, look at it, see what it is, see what it feels like. Um, you know, notice the gills, notice the, the spores, notice the shape of it, all those kind of things. And then, you know, maybe later try to identify it. And the other thing I wanted to point out is you're 100% right on, you know, joining a club or going out with other people, especially older people because they tend to have a lot more experience 
Um, because you can always go and get something like, you know, this book, this is the National Audubon Society Field Guide to Mushrooms. Um, you know, it's a great resource, but if you just took this book and you went out by yourself in the mushroom, into the forest to look for mushrooms, you'd be completely lost. And it's, <laughs> it's really difficult. So you do kind of need that, uh, that mentorship to help you. And, you know, that's something we went to the Telluride Mushroom Festival last year, went on a couple forays with some expert mycologists. Um, and it was amazing, you know, mm. how much we leveled up in our identification skills just by spending even one or two days with somebody who really knows what they're doing. Um, and it, it is also really location specific. So your videos, for example, Adam, I love your videos and I've learned so much from watching, you know, how to identify different kinds of mushrooms. But, you know, you're filming in, in mainly Western Pennsylvania. So if someone's on the West Coast or someone's in, you know, Alberta where we are or, Texas or wherever, um, there's going to be lots of different variations and lots of different um, types of mushrooms that you might not see in Pennsylvania. So that's why it's so important to hook up with a local club or a local, mm -hmm. you know, mycologist to really learn that. that that's yeah, great. Absolutely. So, oh. in finding those clubs, Google or user favorite search engine, uh, NAMA, North American Mycological Association, and then you can hit the clubs page and there's a whole list of mushroom clubs. And if you can't have access to them locally if they're not in your hometown there are always forays nationally so don't be afraid to travel and to hook up with some of these clubs because you're going to meet a lot of great people and you'll meet a lot of great mushrooms as well yeah totally totally so Tegan, if you see any questions coming in the comments feel free to uh yeah. point some of them out um i saw people people are very inspired by your videos so keep it up they're saying Oh, yeah. Well, if you watch my videos, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I know I don't get a chance to say thank you to everybody who does watch the videos, but it really does mean a lot to me. Like when I'm out there in the woods, I feel like everybody who leaves a comment or hits the like button, I feel like you're out there with me. So thanks a lot. It means a lot. That's so great. So, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, how difficult it is to identify mushrooms, but not all mushrooms are difficult to identify. So what are kind of some beginner mushrooms or somebody who's just getting into foraging? What are some of the mushrooms that they could go um, and, and pretty confidently identify or at least go and find? Uh, just go to the grocery store. Those are the easiest ones to identify. <laughs> Somebody already did it for you. <laughs> um, but honestly, if you're going to go into the woods, there's, there's this concept known as the foolproof four. Um, but everybody's foolproof four differs because it's all location specific, as you already alluded to. But most of the foolproof four mushrooms, no matter what your list is, they generally apply to a wide range of areas, like morel mushrooms. Now, I know there are some lookalikes to morel mushrooms. There are species uh, in other genera, like the gyromitra genus, but those don't necessarily look like morel mushrooms when you know what morel mushrooms actually look like. But morels would be at the top of the list. Chicken of the woods is another one. Hen of the woods, also the maitake mushroom. Uh, oyster mushrooms are easy to identify. The harissi of mushrooms... Um, lion's mane and bear's head tooth and comb tooth, all those ones. Now notice that most of those mushrooms that I mentioned don't have gills with the exception of the oyster mushroom, but that one grows on wood. And so whenever you're talking about polypore mushrooms or ascomycete fungi, the ones that don't necessarily have gills to disperse their spores, those are generally safer. A lot of exceptions that are out there, generally they're safer. I mean, bolete mushrooms are very easy to at least get down to the bolete group of mushrooms, but putting a species name on it can be a different matter. But beliefs are generally considered to be safe in most cases. But once you get into the guild mushrooms, then you kind of got to understand the nuances of those mushroom characteristics when you get there. But those ones that I mentioned, those are great for beginners. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Like the guild black mushrooms, once you get yeah, down to black it. Trump, those are easy. But somebody actually did just send me a message saying they accidentally harvested devil's urn fungi if you guys are familiar with devil's urn urnula craterium and they ate them without positively like going through all the characteristics of black trumpets and devil's urn and comparing and contrasting so i guess there are some lookalikes to black trumpets but i would throw black trumpets up there as well <laughs> yeah but you're right when you get down to some of the gold mushrooms like the deadly gallerinas versus say you know uh flamuline or honey mushrooms or something like that um you definitely want to know what you're doing or definitely want to be with somebody who knows what they're doing because uh that's that's where it can get a uh, little bit you know a little bit sketchy so. um so i wanted to talk a little bit about your course so you just launched a foraging wild mushrooms course which i think is so so cool and some of the things you say you know people go through the course uh will be i be able to identify with confidence over 50 wild edible mushrooms, identify the most common poisonous mushrooms that grow in Eastern North America, be able to safely and confidently and sustainably harvest wild edible mushrooms and bring them home to create meals, 
and be able to learn about medicinal mushrooms. So I think it's such a cool thing, the course that you put together. I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about it and talk about uh, where people could go to learn more about the course and sign up. Yeah, so over the past couple of years, I've been working on this course. It's called Foraging Wild Mushrooms. You can go to foragingwildmushrooms.com. But a lot of classes in person. I take a lot of people out into the woods. But not everybody can come to Pennsylvania, and I can't always get to other cities. Um, and in the winter time, it's like there's not much out here in these particular Northeast America. And so I thought I'd create something that's kind of uh, ongoing. Uh, you can go through it depending on which season you're in, spring, summer, fall, and winter. You can learn about a variety of different mushrooms on your own time. And it's organized and curated to guide you through the seasons, covering all the basics and a little more. Um, so I decided to put that together the past couple of years, and I finally launched it earlier this week. So it's at foragingwildmushrooms.com right now, and you can learn more about it there. But I'll always continue to put out YouTube content, at least in the near future, for the next couple of years. So if you don't sign up for that course, that's perfectly fine, because there's always going to be a lot of content produced uh, from Learn Your Land on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram. And in person, if you guys can ever come out here to Pennsylvania, or if I can travel to your town. But if you're looking for something else, something to kind of guide you along from the beginning and then keep pushing you forward, that's what the course is for. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, there's always so much information. I know how much effort it takes to put those videos together. So we really appreciate that as a community for sure. But sometimes it is nice to have a more regimented course or something that you can go through, you know, step one, step two, step three, um, which is why something like that course is, is so valuable. And I'm sure people are going to find a lot of value. I don't know if anybody can hear our dogs barking in the background, but uh, the fresh cat dogs are having a time. I want to go through some of these questions here. Um, oh, I guess on the course, somebody's asking, Will you have any other open enrollment periods if we can't make this one? I believe so. So probably in the next couple of months, I'll open enrollment again. And people ask, why would you close? Well, I do a lot of traveling, and I like to be home and answer a lot of the emails that people have as they work their way through the course. And I like to get people in at the same time because they generally will take it at the same time and maybe even finish near the same time. And so then I can get another batch of students in, then another batch every time I open it up. But I'm doing it so that I can almost kind of limit the amount of people in so I can work with them as well. So I do plan on opening it up. I'm not quite sure when, um, but if you're on the Learn Your Land email newsletter, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see another post in the future when I do open it up. So that's a great, great. question. Yeah. Very cool. Excellent. Another question we're getting a lot from the community right now is, what is your favorite kind of mushroom? My favorite kind of mushroom is one that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the one that I can't identify because that is a challenge that I will take on and I will try my best to identify. But a lot of people say, well, which one is your favorite mushroom? And I'm sure that's what um, the question actually meant. What's your favorite mushroom? But honestly, it's always the one that I just most recently learned. Whatever one I most recently learned, I, lo I love that one right there. And I can't wait to find it again. I can't wait to show people if they're interested in hearing what I have to say. I like learning about its role. I like learning about its ecology. I like knowing that I hadn't seen it before, but now I'm seeing it everywhere because I put a name on it. But of course, that answer doesn't always uh, suffice whenever people ask me what's my favorite mushroom. So I would say probably the reishi mushroom. I really okay. Like that. <laughs> that's, that's one of the first mushrooms that kept me tethered to the forest. Um, and so I love looking for it every year. I mean, I have a bottle of it right next to my bed. I take it almost every single night before I go to bed. It's just a beautiful mushroom. I have them scattered throughout my house. Uh, it decomposes Hemlock, tree. hemlock trees are one of my favorite trees here in Pennsylvania. It's our state tree. Uh, we have old growth hemlock forests here in Pennsylvania. Uh, so it's just part of the ecology of one of my favorite areas to explore. So that's why I love that mushroom. Excellent. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I know. But, you know, picking a, a favorite is, is definitely difficult. My favorite actually is lion's mane just because I love to grow it. And, and, you know, same thing because of the medicinal properties. Um, have you named any mushrooms? Ah, that's uh, I mean, I just n throw out names, but I don't have anything scientifically published or anything like that. No, I haven't named a mushroom. Maybe one day I will, but if I don't, that's perfectly fine. Because, I mean, names get you so far anyway, and names are all made up. I mean, I don't think the mushroom cares what its name is. It just, like, satisfies an urge inside of humans to put names on everything. But maybe one day I'll have something or something named after me. But if I don't, that's okay, because my work entails something much deeper than that. Yeah, definitely. 
definitely just learning all about mushrooms. So we're gonna we're gonna do a couple more questions and from. There was a question. Um, have you done any research on the mushroom that eats through plastic? I haven't done any research on it, but I'm familiar with a lot of fungi, the white rot fungi. They're the ones in nature that degrade a lot of the trees. They degrade lignin. They also degrade cellulose, hemicellulose. They're able to, through their ends, to degrade a lot of uh, organic material with a lot of carbons and a lot of hydrogens, and plastic would be one of those. Uh, so I'm familiar with a lot of but I don't personally do research on that, but I appreciate the people who do research on it because uh, I think that's an important step moving forward to look into those kind of bioremediation tools. Uh, but of course, it'd be important to also reduce the use of plastic and to try to get rid of it completely. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. But yeah, mushrooms are amazing in a variety of ways and their ability to grade plastic is just one of them. Right on. Excellent. Yeah, your video is frozen here, but I think your audio is still coming through great. So uh, that's no problem at all. Um, one more question here. When it comes to harvesting chaga, when is the best time? I guess the, the spore dreams here is asking on Instagram. There seems to be a lot of confusion around that topic um, in their hometown. Okay, well, it looks like we probably, oh, oh yeah, yeah, we definitely yeah. lost the connection with uh, Adam there. So um, might be might be an issue with the internet. I think we're still live, looks like it. Yeah, I guess we're still live. Anyways, Adam, uh, thank you so much for coming on Fresh Camp Friday. That was really cool. I know you know everything that you do with your videos um, and everything else that you do takes so much effort, and uh, the mushroom community really, really, really appreciates that. So again, if you if you for some reason don't know about Adam Harrison, I'm sure you do because we got a lot more <laughs> live visitors now than we've had before. So uh, there's a lot of hearts flying around. People definitely love you. Uh, definitely. Yeah. So. Uh, um, yeah, head over to his YouTube channel, Learn Your Land, and go check out that course, Forging Wild Mushrooms.